welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 196, Laugh Out Loud Stories, an interview with Bethany Turner, coming to you on Thursday, May 7th, 2020. Hello, peeps. How are you? It's post-Easter. Did anybody actually have any peeps for Easter? I don't really like marshmallow candies, so that's not my thing, but it seems to be the big thing now to make a big deal out of hating peeps. So anyway, I just just like saying, hey, peeps, and it's sunny out. So my solar energy cells are being (laughs) filled with energy. And then I get, you know, pretty goofy when I'm podcasting, talking, or probably just on the inside of my head, also still goofy. (laughs) So how are you? Are you managing? Are you staying at home and not losing your mind? Have you already lost your mind? I've been joking with my friends that I think the next big pandemic is obesity. Yes, indeed. I keep telling myself I need to stop baking. I need to stop eating everything John cooks. But it's really, really hard because we have time and it's delicious. And I haven't had time to bake this much in years. So, oh, well, I'm just going to have to keep on exercising hard. I actually did start exercising partially so that I could continue to eat yummy food. So guess what? Two days ago in your time, and I'm actually recording this a week before you hear it, was my 30th wedding anniversary. Oh, I know. It's very exciting. And that's why I write romance, because after 30 years, John and I are still flirting in the kitchen when we're each working in our separate offices, which is basically really, really fun and occasionally terribly distracting. (laughs) But I'll take fun anyway. So I'm I'm excited. So hopefully we will have had lots of fun because we're going to have a five day weekend because our anniversary is on a Tuesday and we have a public holiday on a Friday. So we were like, hey, actually, John was like, hey, let's take off Monday. And I was like, no, we have to save your vacation days so that we, we can go someplace when we can go someplace. And then we were watching the news. I'm like, we're not going to be able to go someplace for a really long time, are we? So here in Sweden, it's no problem. We can go bicycling. So we're going to hopefully do that if it's not raining. And um, even though that's exercise and that's good, of course, I also have it in my mind. It's spring. Let's bicycle to an ice cream place we haven't tried yet. So we have some plans. Um We're also making a cheesecake. There's a lot of food involved. There's always food involved when it comes to anything that I'm doing that I think is fun or celebratory or, um, yeah, I guess just for any reason. (laughs) There's also a lot of food in my books. I think I've told you that the narrator of Little Miss Lovesick and Unexpected Superhero, who's a really good friend of mine and an awesome audiobook narrator, just making a pitch here for Catherine Gaffney. It's Catherine with a C. Um, she told me once when she was doing the narration for Little Miss Lovesick, she's like, you're making me hungry. You're always talking about food in your books. And I'm like, I never really thought about that, but I probably do. (laughs) So anyway, I am trying not to be part of the obesity pandemic by at least continuing to exercise in my living room. And let me just tell you, if you feel like exercising in your living room is not doing you the justice that going to the gym would have, you're not doing it right. Because my friend Joe, who's been kind of doing some personal trainer work with me, has been giving me exercises where I'm like, ow, ow, (laughs) the same amount of ows when I go to the gym. So trust me, it can be done. And what was that guy's name? Jack LaLanne? I think that's his name, who became really, really famous like a long time ago before I was born, um, (laughs) for becoming this really big bodybuilder by just using like his own body and his own body weight and stuff as his resistance. Anyway, so you should know this. If you have to be working out in your living room or the basement or wherever you work out, you can do it. And it will be maybe not fun, but then think about the cheesecake that you can eat. So (laughs) that's my pitch for exercising. All right, listen, Bethany Turner, hilarious. I love her. She's my new friend. We're going to be friends forever. I have decided this and she agreed that it would be fine with her. This was so much fun talking to her and interviewing her and talking to her about her new book, Hadley Beckett's Next Dish. If you like comedy, especially romantic comedy, you need to check out this book. Like you're probably just going to want to buy it because it is really funny. I really enjoyed it. And I have watched a ton of episodes of TV shows starring Gordon Ramsay, the famous UK chef, um, 
Is he American now? I don't know. <laughs> um, but anyway, in my mind, I'm reading this going, like I sort of see like a young Gordon Ramsay in my mind. And then I think maybe in the acknowledgments at the end, she might have said something. I read something somewhere, you know, that um, of all the shows, cooking shows that she watched that, yeah, some of them were ones with Gordon Ramsay in it. Anyway, it's absolutely adorable. I loved the book. I really think you should check it out. Hadley Beckett's Next Dish by Bethany Turner big pitch. <laughs> but right now, totally, you have to just listen to this interview. And hopefully you'll get some great tips for uh, writing in general, writing funny. And um, hopefully we'll just make you laugh and make you feel good about life for an hour while you are doing things that maybe you don't want to do, like staying inside when it's a beautiful day out or whatever. I hope that you are safe. I hope that you're well. I hope that you're taking care of yourself and the people around you and um, get some writing done. It's a good time to get some writing done. Very exciting. I'm working on my book, uh, Encouragement for Writers. Not sure. Rough draft name. Not sure if that's the name <laughs> uh, that I hope to have out by October. I'm working on the Right Now Workshop Writers Conference, which of course now is not going to be live and in person in Malmö, Sweden in October, but it is still going to be October 9th and 10th, and it will be a live virtual conference. I'll tell you more about that later. And basically, I'm just really excited. Life is good, and I have lots of really good work, and I'm loving it, so I'm probably working a few too many hours, but I'm also trying to whoo, take a deep breath, do a little bit of watching episodes of Castle. I've been sort of hoarding the last two ep the last two seasons of the show on DVD so that I can watch it like one episode at a time, sort of the way that I'm <laughs> saving up the, um, the small amount of Trader Joe's dark chocolate covered almonds that I have because it will be, you know, impossible to get them for <laughs> who knows how long. <laughs> So yes, that's what I'm doing. I'm having little bits and pieces of things that I love and um, reminding myself that my life is really, really good. So I don't mind working hard. I hope that you are having a great day. Enjoy the episode and we will talk to you again next week for the next episode of the show. Have a great one. Here's Bethany. Today's guest is Bethany Turner. Bethany is the award-winning author of The Secret Life of Sarah Hollenbeck and Wooing Katie McCaffrey and the Director of Administration for Rock Springs Church in Southwest Colorado. A former bank executive and a three-time cancer survivor, all before she turned 35, Bethany knows that when God has plans for your life, it doesn't matter what anyone else has to say. Because of that, she's chosen to follow his call to write. She lives with her husband and their two sons in Colorado, where she writes for a new generation of readers who crave fiction that tackles the thorny issues of life with humor and insight. Welcome, Bethany. Thank you. I'm so excited to be chatting with you today. Me too. You and I already had like five minutes of hysterical laughter before we started. Kind of had to cut it off and say, no, 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 save it for the air. Save it for the air. <laughs> That's right. And if, it, if people are wondering, but how if you just met, like, do you guys know each other? No, no, we don't nope. know each other. <laughs> nope. we're go if you count the email, we're on what, 40 minutes of contact in this world ever? Yes, ever. Because yeah. I read my email really late. <laughs> <laughs> See, I wasn't going to bring that part up, but if you oh, choose to thanks. go for it. All right, we'll, we'll edit that out. <laughs> yeah, so so here we are, and the thing is, is that in, um, in an hour and 45 minutes, I went from saying a bad word out loud really loudly to, I can do this, and here we go, let's record. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... I I got to read the first page. Actually, I read quite a few um, bits of your your homepage, your uh, sorry of your website. The first two paragraphs of your homepage, as a woman of a similar age, made me laugh out loud, but but not like the really nice laugh. It was one of those barking laughs, like pop. Oh. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have done that in the little microphone. <laughs> yes, sorry. I love it. That's the best guy. <laughs> now now you all know what I said. <laughs> I love that. I'm like, yeah, I don't, we have our public laughs, but it's yes. those private laughs that we never want anyone to hear who are the best and most rewarding laughs. So I'm glad yes. I got to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is exciting. You are, um, so you and I are recording uh, in April, but your book yeah. comes out on May 5th. And by the time people hear me say all that, it'll be May 7th. 
Yay! Yeah. Congratulations yeah. on your book coming out. Thank you. Launch has been such a whirlwind. You know, no. I and, bet. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a crazy two days. <laughs> I'm sure it has. I can speak that with authority a month in advance. So I yeah. think you can, yeah. I can, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but um, you have a really interesting um, tone to your to, to your writing and to the kinds of stories that you tell. So as much as I want to be like, oh my gosh, let's just talk about how fun and funny you sound. Maybe we should talk about your books, which I what? bet. <laughs> so I've only gotten to read. I just have to. I have to tell everybody. Everybody. <laughs> When I was um, like trying to get my hair ready and like make sure that everything was prepared for an interview that I can't say I was totally expecting to be on my calendar. So I, I download Bethany's book. I'm starting it in the Kindle on the one hand. I've got another eye on the web page. I'm printing out her bio so I can read that. It's like I had, you know, the seven arms of, I don't know, I can't actually think of anybody. I, I almost said Medusa, but she didn't have arms. She had... Hair. <laughs> yeah, who had seven arms? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's. Oh, I think um, isn't there a a, a Hindi uh, priest priestess or no. god? We'll say there is because okay. I don't know different. So yeah, all right. Sure. I think yeah. I heard somebody so say the seven that. arms of the Hindi uh, of princess. Whoever. Yeah, yeah, her. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm standing in front of my computer waiting for Zoom, you know, it gets to, to the top of the hour. And I'm, my first thought was, oh, like, I hope that she didn't have any problems getting on. And then my, my other thought was, but this is a really good book and I want to keep on reading. So I hope she's a few minutes late. <laughs> and then because this book, okay, hold on. Did I write it down? See, the, uh, the bios usually don't actually have the name of the current book. Okay, Bethany, I'm going to calm down for one second. Tell us, what's the name of your <laughs> new book? <laughs> that um oh. the, no psh, tiny detail um <laughs> the new book is called hadley beckett's next dish okay which is hard for me to say every time no matter how long i've been living with this title <laughs> we actually call it hadbeck um <laughs> it's kind of our that's our hashtag and what the team calls it and all that so i call it hadbeck most of the time so when i have to say it i'm like hadley beckett's next dish it so i have to think real hard but yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, and tell us the title is because the the um, general storyline is? The general storyline is that our heroine, Hadley Beckett, is a celebrity chef. Um, so not just a chef. I mean, think Food Network, um, you know. Rachel Ray. Um, Rachel Ray, Gordon Ramsay, um, Pioneer Woman, that level of celebrity chef. And... Um, She's just as sweet as could be and up and coming and really um, starting to take the culinary entertainment world by storm. She's put into, um, in the very first, in the prologue, actually, we um, meet our hero who doesn't seem like much of a hero, uh, Max Cavanaugh. And he is the star of the culinary entertainment world. He's the big man on campus has been for years, um, widely considered the greatest chef of the generation. And he's a complete and total jerk. Um, <laughs> so as Hadley and Max um, come together in this show and, and Max has a very horrible um, public meltdown um, that kind of leads to his downfall and so then really our story truly begins a little bit later when Max and Hadley are forced to work together and we have a bit of a kinder and gentler Max, but do we believe it or not? And so that's when our story kind of begins. Nice, nice. Yeah. Okay, so that sounds fun. But, you know, reading, reading the actual book is so much better, you know, than reading the back cover copy or listening Always. to authors tell you about it. So, so you get on the call right at the point where, because I was guessing, I'm like, okay, celebrity chefs, one of them has a terrible breakdown. And I have a guess as to what the breakdown is. I'm sure I'm right because I'm super smart. But Of course. <laughs> but nonetheless, you interrupted me before I could get to it. So it's almost like when you're watching a show and it's like, tune in next week to see what happens. I'm like, no! Which I love. It's like it came straight out of the Food Network. Because my family, we watch a lot of Restaurant Impossible. I don't know if you watch Restaurant don't Impossible, but it, 
it's always, um, it's Robert Irvine has two days and $10,000 to go in and save a failing restaurant. <laughs> and um, inevitably, he also has to save a family. I mean, it's just, it's falling apart because the family is in shreds and all these things. And, and they, it's always the reveal or like what he thinks of their food or whatever. And it's always just this moment. And my younger son has, I mean, my older son, um, he's 17. He has taken to every time, like filling in the gaps of what he thinks is going to be said, but he <laughs> makes it as outlandish and hilarious as possible. So like during the little commercial break, we have our, so anyway, that's in my head. It's like, I want to fill in the gaps of what's happening next for you. I want to give you a fake version like my son would, but I won't do that to you. <laughs> oh, let's see. We'll see. If okay. for some reason you and I cannot fill the time that we have here for the interview. Uh-huh. <laughs> As if. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then we'll, then we'll see how many fake, fake versions and you can tell me to choose okay. option A, B, or C. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay. that's a good plan <laughs> yeah yeah okay so here's the thing obviously I think this book is hysterical I'm loving it and despite the fact that like once the interview is over I have no particular um need to finish the book there's nothing more I can say to add to the interview except <laughs> I can't wait till the end of my work day because I'm going back to the book <laughs> yay thank you that's a nice compliment. I appreciate that. Yay. <laughs> so I'm kind of guessing just by the titles of the other two and the design of your website, which is totally romantic comedy cute, um, that the other books are probably similar. So tell us a little bit, like I got to read uh, some of, you know, who, who are you and how did you become who you are on your website? But just tell us a little bit about you. You've got some family history that just made me go, oh my gosh, you must have been one of the people who was reading Ready Player One at the same time I was. And <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my, um, my family, I grew up very, um, well, I grew up in Kentucky and I'm in Colorado now, so it's like, it's, it's a surprising amount of cultural, culture shock between the two. But, um, so, but my family is very pop culture driven. I mean, we have always been. Now, we're also good little Christians. <laughs> Sorry, that sounds so patronizing. <laughs> I mean it. It's like, we love the Lord first and foremost, but we also love celebrities. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um so we would always, you know, we would watch TV together, like, um, and of course, in the 80s, I guess, which really the time when that was at its height, when I was growing up and all of that, and we're watching Family Ties, and we're watching um, Growing Pains, and you know, all these 80s sitcoms, but we would watch them together, and when there's a very special episode, which I miss very special episodes. Now yeah. it's like, why does every episode have to be a very special episode? Um, <laughs> anyway, that, get, don't get me on that tangent. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, you know, we would chat about it and all of that. And so it was always a really important part. And like my, one of my earliest, most hilarious memories um, is my mother um, playing the cast recording album a record, children. It's a big CD that we used to have back in the day. Um, <laughs> you should <laughs> not let sit in the sun. No. It's like, and you can't scratch it. It's, it's yeah, they're <laughs> horrible. And I'm glad we don't use them anymore. And yet, and yet they're back. I don't understand. But anyway, <laughs> um, they, um, she would play the original Broadway cast recording of Camelot with um, Richard Burton and Julie Andrews, but she acted it out with all of my stuffed animals. And I remember the stuffed animals being, it was like Littlefoot from Land Before Time. He was Lancelot, of course, you know? And um, so this whole memory, it's like, and that, that was my childhood. I mean, things like that, where it's just not, maybe not normal by some <laughs> standards, but it was my normal and it was hilarious and wonderful. And we laughed and but movies and TV became such an important part of my brain and my psyche and my sister's same thing. It's like everything is a pop culture reference and um, it's definitely 100% influenced everything I write, everything I do. Yeah, I totally hear you. It's like well, we're sisters who just met. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I grew up with, um, on a clear day, two channels and a fuzzy PBS 
um, you know, sometimes if three channels and PBS all came in together, we were freaking out. We have four wow. choices. What That's should like Christmas. We watch? Yeah. It's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and then we bought a movie theater. So then I was a kid working at a movie theater. So That's amazing. It was. It was. I mean, there's, of course, tons of downsides. There's ups and downs to every single thing in life. But sure. there was a lot of amazing parts. Yeah. Oh, so even though we didn't really sit around the TV having, I mean, you make it sound really kind of idyllic, honestly, as opposed to my dad and my brother had three female choices that they could be. You change the channel. You hold the rabbit ears. <laughs> it wasn't quite as idyllic, but it definitely is good stuff to add into novels. So yes, <laughs> worthwhile. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, I married someone who is even more geeky than me, which brought out the super geek in me. So, like, um, I would say that if you ask me very seriously who my heroes in life are, like, who are the people I admire most, love the most, like, who's at the top of my list? It's definitely got to be God, my husband, John, and Captain America. Followed not very far down by Peter Parker, because he's way <laughs> cool for a teenager. <laughs> And today I just read your post about does Jesus look like Zac Efron? <laughs> yeah. I, I <laughs> when I wrote that, I even asked my husband, I was like, have I gone too far this time? Have I gone? Nope, nope, I'm going with it. Because it was just like I had this image and I'm like, oh yeah, Zach, that's how I saw Jesus in my head, right there. So yeah, it's it's messed me up in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> well and yet you know yeah yeah you know I would go with it because at least at least you know Zach doesn't know well I, he might now I would like him to can we make sure that he does <laughs> do you remember uh, I have it up but um I'll have to flip away from where I am and um but do you remember what the tagline is on your website because when I actually got around to reading it I was laughing out loud again but you know not the it's... cool laugh yeah <laughs> It was the barking laugh again. The bark laugh. I love the bark. Um, I believe it's on an eternal mission to love better, to write stories that matter, and to get John Stamos to want to be my friend. Is that the <laughs> Yes. That is, yeah. that, if that's, that's not it, one. that's pretty close. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. A little bit of backstory there. I have to, and I've you know, you may have seen some of this on my website, but it's John Stamos. I mean, my fame with him has been going on for 33 years, I guess, <laughs> at this point, because my very first prize that I ever won, my award that I ever won for my writing was in the second grade. And we, it was a state level writing competition. Like this was a big deal. It was the governor's cup. And and so it was a huge honor in our state to even be in the finals. And so there I was in the finals and we had to write an essay on um, what, if we could have, um, if we could have lunch with any person living or dead, you know, that same old thing, who would it be? Yeah. Why? What would we talk about? All of that. And it's like, there were these do-gooders all around me who wrote these things like, I mean, it was the eighties, like President Reagan. Um, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, and then, you know, I, looking back now, I'm like, I should have said Jesus. I should have said, <laughs> you know, like I can think of all these things that I probably should have said, or like, you know, people who are like, oh, my, my, my dead grandmother. Cause I wish I had one more day with her, you know, no, no, no. Um, I chose John Stamos and um, <laughs> wrote my essay about having lunch with John Stamos, who, of course, at the time was Uncle Jesse on Full House. Of course, he's once again Uncle Jesse on Full House, but this was 1.0. The original, Uncle Jesse. yeah. Yeah, the OG. <laughs> and um, so, and yeah, and I, I won. So, wow. Like, yeah, so the state of Kentucky should not have validated me in that way if I was ever going to write about anything that wasn't so pop culture driven. It was like, it was sealed right then. But like, oh, I was rewarded for writing about John Stamos. So, <laughs> so even, yeah, at seven years old, this was my brain. It, it hasn't changed. <laughs> nice. Well, I like it. And obviously it's worked well for you for storytelling. It's given me stuff to use. That's for, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> now, 
from a writerly perspective, we'll just bring it back down to serious industry mm-hmm. talk now. <laughs> okay. um, like my fourth question down, and you know, we're totally going to mess up my little order of talking about things. But, um, but seriously, Rule one breakers. of the things I know, see, that's good. That's us. We're rebels. Yeah, that's and us. here's the, we've got a cause. It is to give any advice that we can to the people who are listening so that they go, okay. yes, that's right. Okay. Advice. Okay. Got it. Yes. All right. Okay. So here's the question. Ready. Ready. You and I love pop culture. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I can tell that you love writing about it because I've read some of it. You've been talking about it. I also do the same. Some writers have a bona fide, really good uh, argument in their head. Should I or shouldn't I? Because if I write with pop culture references, immediately on publication, my book is like totally in the now, which is great. But what happens a couple of years later, will my book die? So right. have you had this conversation in your, in your head? I have. I've had this conversation in my head. I've had this conversation with my editor, actually. And <laughs> here's where we always land. The beautiful thing is I'm not really very hip. <laughs> <laughs> and so my references, okay, like in The Secret Life of Sarah Hollenbeck, most of my references really are, are more timeless than, um, and Wu and Katie McCaffrey also. It's like, there's, there's just this element of, wow, that was hip in 1987. That's how my brain usually works. Yeah. So, which I, again, I choose to say, well, they're timeless, not dated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Sabrina. <laughs> like Sabrina, exactly. So I, um, but it is a thing. And it's like, I do kind of think of that of, of um, how is this going to, how will this translate in a few years? And in most cases, like I said, I'm, I'm, it's not very hip and now. <laughs> and like, I'm not referencing Billie Eilish and, and I don't know, I can't even think of people who are considered cool now. I, that's how yeah. uncool I am. But um, <laughs> it's, it's much more likely to be, um, you know, um, well, in this book about chefs, we reference Julia Child a fair amount. Julia Child is timeless. Julia Child will yeah. always be an applicable reference. Yeah. Um, you know, now in The Secret Life of Sarah Hollenbeck, um, there are so many references and really they're more like, they're really just kind of like, no one ever should have been referencing them at all. Like there's a lot of reference of the thorn <laughs> birds. There's a lot of reference of ABBA. Um, it's like, <laughs> oh, no, hey, I'm in Sweden right now. Oh, that is are. a timeless reference in, in Sweden. Okay. Maybe I've been doing it all wrong. Maybe I need to be marketing the book in Sweden more. <laughs> there you go. I hadn't thought of that. You guys are my target demo. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, so so that's actually the answer is it's when I do play that through in my head though, a little bit of of is there is this gonna just be ridiculous in three years? And most of the time, I mean I'm sure I I get it wrong sometimes, but most of the time, um I do think it's relatively timeless and either you know it or you don't, because it's like, you may not know it now when I'm writing about it. um, But that's not going to change in the future. It's like, you can either research it or you just won't get that reference. Yeah. Thanks to be you, you know, (laughs) (laughs) unfortunately that's my writing um, approach all too often. It's sorry. Thanks to be you. No, you know what though? I really do think I, I'm really a strong believer that if you entertain yourself, then you've got a market. There are people out there who are going to be equally or more entertained because they're similar enough to you. Like you and I, we've already decided that we're going to be friends for life. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, we've so exchanged obviously- lockets. You know, we've got... <laughs> <laughs> got the best that's friend locket in the works. It's happening. That's right. That's yeah. right. You can be the B and I'll be the F. And <laughs> exactly. We got this. <laughs> Woo. So, so I really do think that writing something that genuinely entertains you, makes you laugh, makes you cry is, I think it's probably the best way to write the best book and your, your niche audience will be niche or niche. I agree. It could be one or the <laughs> other. <laughs> I will say niche as the Kentucky girl that I am. <laughs> Me too. But okay, so you read Ready Player One, right? Yes, but it has been so long. I'm like, That's okay. I, 
Okay, so yeah. yes, it's, but it's I not would, a specific I would be reference. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> but but you may remember that while you were reading it, you were like, "Know it, know it, know it." I don't know what that is. Know uh-huh. it, know it, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it really exactly. didn't affect you know your enjoyment of the book because in general no. you got the idea that these are references that you have to be able to unlock in order to you know get to the next level, and that right. was it. Didn't Absolutely. really matter if you knew or didn't know what growing pains is, but how could right. you not know? Although I'm going to say, if you don't, please reach out to me at once. I will yes. help you. Yes. We that is you. unacceptable. That's right. We can, I'm sure, find YouTube links. Absolutely. And I'll start you out. I'm like, here's what you need to know to get started. Skip season one. Let's start on season two. Ignore the whole Hawaii thing when when Mike met that girl, you know, it's like, I'll be able to guide you through the process. So um, yes, please reach out to me. (laughs) But still, yes, you can still enjoy, hopefully the books, even if you don't get growing pains references. (laughs) And, you you know, just to be clear, everybody see bethanywright.com. That's the website. That's how you find out more about really any, any really important 80s reference, right? Pretty much. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a sickness. So you'll get more than you ever knew you needed in life. I like it though. But you know what? If you have a cold and I have a cold, are either of us really sick if we're together? I don't know. Mm, so that's deep, man. Maybe, maybe it's not a sickness if you're with someone who with the same. That's so true. The rest of the world's sick. They're the that's ones. Right. They're the ones who are <laughs> not right. <laughs> that's right. Like, we have it going on. (laughs) Okay. So, so obviously at some point you said to yourself, storytelling, I think that's my gig. Um, And maybe it was for fun when you were a little kid and maybe it was always. And, but tell us like, how did you become uh, interested in the idea of writing an entire book and getting it out there in the world? Yeah. Um, okay. So as a kid, yeah, like I said, I, you know, I wrote about John Stamos and different things. It's <laughs> like, I, th- I think I always knew I was, I was a decent ish writer, but I didn't enjoy it necessarily. It wasn't a, it wasn't a passion. It wasn't a, um, anything like that. So it really never occurred to me. I was not one of those authors who knew it was what I wanted to be when I grew up. That just wasn't me. Um, I actually wanted to be in the Disney studio chorus. Oh, um, or a presidential historian. Those were my dreams. Good so, choices. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Obviously, neither of them came to fruition, but regardless. <laughs> so, um, so I really didn't write anything um, until um, my 20s, probably, um, maybe early 30s. And what it actually started as was... Um, I was in banking. I was actually vice president of a bank and I was head of operations. We had gone through two major like buyouts, conversions, mergers, and as head of operations, that was basically my wheelhouse and I'm overseeing these things and it's a stressful time in the best of circumstances. And um, I had young kids at home, I guess at the time, you know, in the eight and five range or so. And um, I really, I, I needed a creative outlet was really all it was because I had always done community theater. I was a theater major in college because that totally coincides with all these other life goals I just talked about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Uh, so I was a theater major. And so I had always done community theater and directed mostly. And I didn't have time for that. You know, the job was too stressful. I was working 60, 70 hour weeks every week. Um, but I just needed it. And so it started this, you know, I would work the long day, I would come home, I would spend time with the family. And then I'd just spend a little time at night after everybody went to bed, just unwinding, getting it out. And I started writing this story that was, um, well, it's about this woman. This is not either of the titles you've mentioned, any of the titles we've mentioned, but it was just this story about this woman who is completely fictional, but every supporting character in the book was a real life celebrity. And it was just fun. It was, it was like, this is just, Hey, I'm having a conversation with George Clooney. That was the purpose (laughs) of this book. And so it was fun. And, but then it kept going and kept going and it became like this 300,000 word tome um, of of just fun. 
And I had a couple friends who were kind of reading it as I went just for fun. And it was almost like we were doing it like a, um, almost serial or episodic or whatever. And just, Hey, here's a new installment. And, um, but one of my friends who was reading it, he's an actual writer. Um, and he was <laughs> like, <laughs> he's like, this is actually okay. You know? And I'm like, really? And so I kind of started looking at it differently. I turned it into a trilogy and it's this romance and it's, And I self-published it. I mean, it was, again, just like, hey, maybe I'll be able to give out a copy to people. Um, It actually sold a few copies. I mean, nothing remarkable, but, you know, more than I would have ever expected. And so that was kind of the first point of, oh, I like this writing thing. Um, But then I would say when I really got serious about it came just a few years later. Um, I was still at the bank. I was burned out beyond belief. I mean, I just really, I had, it sounds dramatic, but I don't know any other way to say it other than it had just sapped my soul dry and was killing me. And um, it just wasn't where I was supposed to be anymore. And so about that time, um, I felt, you know, God pushing me more into the writing and I quit my job. And that was the (laughs) scariest thing I mean, it was, I did not quit to become a writer. It wasn't that. It, I had no disillusionment of, okay, now this is, it's going to be beautiful and I'm going to make money to do. No, it wasn't that. It was just, I'm not supposed to be here anymore. I got to go and see what I'm supposed to be doing. And in the meantime, I'm going to write because that's God's given me story. And um, so I had these, this glorious summer with my kids. Um, this was 2014. And I'd never spent a summer with my kids not working, you know, right. and it was, it, it was, I got to know my kid. I felt like we got to know each other again and it was magical. And, but in that too, it's like, I discovered this love of writing and I wrote what became the secret life of Sarah Hollenbeck in six weeks, which wow. I don't write that quickly <laughs> ever. Um, but it was just like, God just, it was download. I mean, it, and it, it, and there was no expectation. There was no, I'm going to try to publish this. I'm going to, this is the one I'm a writer. Now it wasn't any of that. It was just God and I were having a great time writing a story together is how it felt. And it was really the most incredible time. And, but then I reached the end of that and it was like, um, you know, this needs work, but this is something special. I mean, I just knew, and, and not to say this is going to change the world, but it was like, this needs to be read. I knew that it was a story that needed an audience. And so I started pursuing that. Um, and sorry, I'm going on and on and on here. I don't know how far you want me to go with that. <laughs> yeah, but, no, that's but right. That, that, that was basically the gist of it. And the way that God pulled it all together of um, the way I um, got a contract and all of that, it was so not the way it normally happens. Um, all right. Well, you can't, it, you can't stop. I, I, there. Know. <laughs> I know. At, at I least can't. give us the, the shorter version of, okay, so how did it happen? Cause how we all want to know. <laughs> well, basically I, so I just, the thing is writing a Christian romance, it was the first Christian romance I'd ever read. I had not, I mean, ever written. And honestly, I'd never read one either. And so I didn't know what the market was like. Um, I mean, I've, been a Christian for a long time. I love romance. I'd never put them together. And <laughs> right, right. So, so what I did was, I mean, what I wrote, I think it was so, I didn't know that it was a little edgy for the Christian market. I didn't know that it was um, kind of outside the box. I didn't know any of that. It was just the story of my heart. And like we were saying earlier, it was what made me laugh and entertained me. And um, so I really when I started pursuing, like I I sent out, I think six query letters to agents and I actually got responses from, I think four or five of them. One of them offered me a contract. I knew it was not the right way to go. It's just one of those gut, Holy spirit. Nope. Not the way to go moments. And it was the right thing because she's actually out of the business now. Um, But the others who rejected me um, gave me such positive feedback of, we really love this story. We love your writing, but the market is not ready for this is what I kept hearing. The market's not there yet. I don't think I can sell this yet. That sort of thing. And so to me, that was encouragement because it was just like, oh, um, 
oh no, you didn't. You know, it's like, don't say, it's like, if it's because I'm not a good writer, it's not a good story. That's a whole different thing. But it's yeah. like, oh no, no, no. God gave me this story. I know I'm supposed to get it published. That means somebody's ready for it. We're pushing. And so that really kind of lit a fire. And so I, I heard um, through a friend about a manuscript submission service called Writer's Edge, mm -hmm. um, which every, you know, I'm a research girl. I did my research and everything said, you know, it's a one in a million shot, even more than, than most one in a million shots of getting a publishing deal. Um, and it's a waste of money and all these things. And that was the other thing. Again, reminder, I'd quit my job. I didn't have the money. Yeah. Um, and yet I just knew it was what I was supposed to do. And this friend sent me a, like 25% of the fee and said, this is my investment in you. And, and be, I know it was the best. And between that and my husband, who thankfully is the more frugal of us, I'm, he's the frugal one, which I'm so glad because sometimes I'm not. Um, but he said, no, this is what you're supposed to do. We'll find the money. So the combination of those two things was like, okay, I'm going to do it. So I sent it to Writer's Edge. Um, the way that works is if they accept you for their list, then um, you get on a list that gets distributed out to writer, I mean, to agents and publishers who may or may not ever look at it. Hmm. Yeah. But at least you have an open door, maybe, is basically how that works. And I, um, they accepted me on their list with, much the same feedback I had been hearing of, we love the story, but just brace yourself. It might be a long wait. The Christian market's not there yet. And so, and then everything I had read too, is like in normal times, expect to be on that list for years, if not forever. Wow. And yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm settling in for the long haul. But it, um, 13 days later, I was contacted by Ravel. Wow. And um, an acquisitions assistant asked to for the full manuscript. I sent it to her. She read it that day, contacted me the next day, said it's going to pub board. And, and you don't even have an agent. I don't have an agent. Mm -mm. <laughs> wow. Nope. <laughs> it was the craziest thing. And my the acquisitions assistant who contacted me, she, like I said, was an assistant. And she had permission to send it on to an editor. But they actually said, you know what? Run with it. So they let her take this. So I actually became her first book. She's now one of the acquisitions editors at Rebel, but I was her first author. And um, so really it was just kind of this, we were pioneers together going out into the brave unknown. <laughs> They're telling me straight up front. It's like, this is very different for the market. We don't know what's going to happen, but let's experiment. Let's see what happens. So they took that chance and um, here we are. Wow. So yeah, sorry, I did that as quickly as I could. But, you know. <laughs> but you know what? People love to hear the story of how did you start? Well, what was the call like? That was a totally different call story than usually you get. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And that was uh, The Secret Life of Sarah Hollenbeck. It was. It became your mm -hmm. first book. And your books are all standalone, not series? They are. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Excellent. So they're all romantic comedy, um, but yeah, standalones. So nice okay note yeah. yourself go look at that book too <laughs> <laughs> yeah you it's like you like the pop culture references the first two have even more than the third one so more than half nice. the is so yeah <laughs> sweet like it okay so um so you're 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 actually a hybrid author um but you have an agent in a traditional publishing house and are you still doing some hybrid work uh some self-published books as well I haven't done anything else. Um, those, so those first three are out there. Um, I don't promote them or anything. And I'm very proud of them, even though I didn't have an editor. I didn't have, you know, I, and there's the thing. Whenever I talk about them, I, I always feel like I don't want people to think I'm talking down to about indie at all, because it's not, there, there are amazing indie books with great editing and great, I'm just talking about talking down about the way I did it. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. I literally just put it out there. Basically it was almost my first draft. It was just for fun, you know? So, so I always kind of want to warn people like, mm. um, <laughs> but uh, what I really always want to warn people on a little more is um, they're not, they're not Christian market. 
they're not horrible. I mean, I'm still a Christian girl and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go too far, but at the same time, they're not Christian or Christian worldview. And yeah. so, um, but yeah, they're out there, but I haven't done anything else. I, you know, I'm, I'm typically a slow writer. I have other things going except on in for life. That first and, book. <laughs> except for that first one, which was so weird. Um, it doesn't usually work that way. I'm usually more like nine months is how long it takes me to write a book. And, um, which I don't suppose is too slow. It's probably pretty average, but, um, so yeah, so I haven't gone back to it. I've always been open to it, but it just hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Very good. And, um, so right this second, you and I are talking, uh, the first Monday in April and, um, this is, let's see, I think my husband told me we've now been home for four weeks here in Malma. (laughs) So, um, the first week I felt like, oh my gosh, this is terrible that the world is sick, but this is like a working vacation. Everything that I was supposed to be doing in addition to writing is canceled. So all I can do is write. So like the first week I was like, this is great. Uh huh. And then the rest of the world caught up with me yeah. <laughs> and suddenly I'm like doing Bible study leading by Skype and I'm like, uh, I mean, Zoom. And I'm like, I wasn't a Bible study leader last week. How did I become one this week? <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. We're putting on church with uh, streaming services, which means that strangely, 20 people still have to show up at church to create and stream a service. <laughs> Amen to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So my life actually got busier after that uh-huh. first week. How's yeah. your writing and your life and with and without? Um, and the reason I mention this is not to not to put a cultural reference in here and date the episode. <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't mind my saying, because you shared it in your bio, um, you've had other times in your life when something big has come in and really disrupted your life. So yeah. How does how do you give yourself grace? How do you find um, healing in your mind when you're in a place where other things are definitely feeling broken? And where does writing play into that for you? I ask because other people might be wondering that right now. That is such a good question. And it hits so um, to the heart of me and my struggles, honestly, because, um, you know, I you know, I had that summer of not working. And then in the, um, in September, I started working at my church. And so I've been there now five and a half years, been at the church for like 15 years almost, but been on staff for about five. And um, it was just a few part-time hours here and there. Well, you know, now I'm director of administration and overseeing a lot. And so in this, um, in this time, um, yeah, everything you just said about like, wow, yeah, so that everyone else can have church from home. It's this whole new thing of the staff and what they're having to do and the volunteers and all of this and overseeing a lot of those efforts and being involved in them. Um, it's been a lot of work. Like, it, it, And so that and other things, you know, I struggle a whole lot. Um, I don't know if you're an Enneagram person, if you've done Enneagram. I, I, only a little bit. I don't actually okay. use it very much. I'm just kind of starting to learn it, but it has helped me understand myself a lot and kind of helped me um, come to terms with some things about myself because it's like, oh, they nailed it. That is me. Therefore, I'm not a freak. There are other people like me out there. So it's really helped me. I'm a three in case any of our listeners are Enneagram people. And part of my personality is um, I fight for approval by doing a good job. Um, which of course that doesn't sound like a horrible thing. Um, it's like, well, we all want that, but I'm so dependent upon like knowing I am valuable in a situation, not just like I'm pretty good in life. It's like, but when it comes to doing things, it's like, I'm going to be the best one at this and you're going to love me and you're going to hire me. And, and, you know, so I wrestle with all of that as it is. And, and I'm the awareness of it helps a lot, but I, I do wrestle with it. And, and so I, um, when I, I struggle a lot with feeling like I'm letting people down when in reality, they're like, oh, I didn't even notice you didn't do it, you know, but in my mind, I'm like, I, I was late to the Zoom call. I'm so sorry. I'll never do it again, you know, and um, that so- was me apologizing in my email to you. I'm so sorry. I've only been started so preparing in the last hour and a half. I'm like, she doesn't need to know this, but I don't know why I feel the need to. 
<laughs> but I identify with, even when you, in the email, I'm like, oh, oh, I, I just felt for you. Cause I'm like, oh, I know how that feels. That's the worst for you. I'm fine. Yeah. But, <laughs> so, you know, it, so a lot of that. And so all of that to say, one of my biggest struggles that I always deal with is a guilt um, when I don't feel like I'm, I'm um, spending the time I should with my family. <laughs> now, the way I said that, it's like, okay, I mean, that again, that's a legitimate thing. And you should feel guilty if you're not spending enough time with your family. <laughs> but the thing is, I spend a lot of time with my family. And um, they're teenage boys. They don't want to spend all their time with their mother anymore anyway. So it's like, I probably spend much more with them than they would like. Um, <laughs> but writing for me has always been something I have to struggle with because it started as a hobby. Oh. and hobbies feel indulgent when life yes. is busy. And so I've had to really, I fight against that. And my husband is my biggest help in all of that of, of making me not feel guilty where he's like, um, well, you do have a contract. You, you <laughs> this is a little more than a hobby or, um, or whatever. Of, You'll be happier if you're writing, please go write. Um, yeah. So <laughs> Thank but God for good husbands. <laughs> I know, right? I'm like, seriously, could not do anything without him. Um, yeah. But I, you know, so that's a struggle for me. And so unfortunately, this is the most long-winded answer to a relatively simple <laughs> question. Story of my life again. But, yeah, uh, mine too. <laughs> okay, it makes me feel better. Um, <laughs> but the fact is, um, when everything is in chaos, writing is what suffers first. Yeah. And that's not wrong is the thing. It's like my writing has to because my relationship with God, my relationship with my husband and my kids and what I do at the church, um, they have to come first um, before it, even though my writing is a calling, my writing is important and it is so much more than I'm contractually obligated. It's like God is asking me to tell story, but that's where I can always get creative with my time because for the most part, you know, when you're launching a book, obviously you've got a lot of um, set times like interviews and podcasts and different things like that. But as a rule, it's like, I can, I can do this whenever. Yeah. Um, If one of your sons wants your time, you can give it to them. I can give him my time. Exactly. And it's like, that may mean I lose some sleep. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, but what, what author, it's like, if you're out there an aspiring writer and you're not losing sleep, you're probably not doing it right. You know, cause, <laughs> cause, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, so, oh yeah. So that, that's the gist of it is, is writing has, it takes a schedule back burner, but I can never let it take a heart back burner. Um, and I have to find that time to do it because it is so vital um, to my sanity, honestly, um, to my relationship with God, my, my best, most treasured times with the Lord come when we're in a groove writing a story. I, I, I don't know how else to explain it, but it's so true. And, um, so yeah, chaos is, is not good for my brain. Um, and it's not usually good for my writing, but at the same time, we find a way to make it work. Yeah. And it, I, I'm taking a wild guess that the part that you didn't say that you probably um, are also thinking is that you really need to, I think this is why you brought up the Enneagrams. You really kind of just need to know yourself a little bit so that yes. you can say, this is, this is my choice and I know why I'm making it and I'm okay with it. Or Absolutely. I didn't, I didn't expect the world to turn upside down and for all, all these other things to suddenly be in my life, but I will find a way to work this in, even if it's not the prior priority it was last week. Absolutely. That's, that nails it. Yes. Cause it, it is. Cause I know that my method, my approach, my schedule, my, any of that isn't going to match up with a lot of other people's. Yeah. But it's like by knowing enough about myself and how it has to work for me, I, that is where I find my grace for myself. Um, and yeah, the knowing I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen to, because the thing is, it's like with, you know, it's like now I get to do these two jobs that do 
like the church and writing that do feel more like callings to me than working in the bank ever did. Not that that can't be a calling. I just don't think it was mine. It was just a job, you know? Um, But at the same time, I can't ever let my, my jobs um, overtake other things in my life again. Like, you know, the things that I did regain with my family and all of that. So I have had to work through all of that. And everything I know about myself now has come from the last really six, five, six years of struggling through it yeah. and, um, and reaching a point where I can forgive myself. I, can, I know who my safe people are to go to when I'm feeling like when I just need to gripe about myself, I know who I can go to because they're the people who will listen to me, love me, support me, but then say, okay, get back to it enough, you know, or, oh, you're being ridiculous right now. What are you even talking about? You know, and you need those people um, and those resources. My my favorite one, I just have to, I have to interrupt for one second to say my favorite one is the, um, you know, you always say that at this point in the process. (laughs) It's like, I'm so glad you're my friend. (laughs) No, that's what would you do without those people? I mean, because every time you reach those points, it's, it's just, you think, Oh, the this world is, the worst is ending. It's ever been, yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And yet, these people. And I went through that a lot with this book of of just being so sure that I'd lost it, that I would never, whatever gift God had given me to write, it was gone. You know, <laughs> he'd been like, <laughs> it had just been on loan. He's like, we're done now. Moving on. Yeah. Um, so, I felt that way like, after burnout. Like my brain was yeah. so messed up and I didn't understand the emotional and um, physical things that had happened mm. that I, I literally, there were days when I was like, okay, God, I think you took it from me. I can be happy anyway. And then I'd be like, are you, are you listening to me whine? Are you reassuring me? Cause I'm not hearing it. <laughs> like, can you do it a little louder? A little louder. That's I right. Know. It's crazy. And it also helps hearing things like, you know, from you of, of, okay, yeah, you've gone through that exact thing that I go through and, and hearing other people's yes. stories helps so much. Yes. This is exactly why I spend, if I did not have a podcast and how many times have I asked myself in the last two, two and a half years, how much more writing would I have done? How many more titles would I have published? Like a lot, but, uh-huh. and I'm looking at you, my friend who's listening. Seriously, I do this for you because people mm-hmm. like Bethany, all the other people who've been on the show, I have so many great guests coming up for you. I want you to feel like you are not alone. You're not weird outside of the group of cool, weird people. <laughs> and no matter weird. what you're going through. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The, the high times we need to celebrate. The low times we need to help each other get through. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love that you do this. And I love that you do it for that reason, because that's so, that's so right. And you know, and one of my big things over the past few years has been really wanting to communicate that, you know, getting a contract, getting a book out, getting, um, making some sales, winning an award, whatever it may be that are these milestones. It's like, that's not the end. That's not the end of the journey. And I think for so many people um, aspiring, it's like, okay, whatever their goal is, whether it's to indie publish or traditional publish, it's like whether it is getting that book out there or it is signing the contract or whatever it is, it's like that's the finish line. And it's that is a milestone. It is not the finish line. Yeah. And so you have to keep building the tools because the circumstances change, but the struggles remain. Yeah. They just look yeah. differently. Yeah. So so I love that you do this and getting to hear different stories. It's so powerful. Well, I have to say, I'm loving yours. I think that this is yeah. just a, a great episode for the time of life that we're finding us in, uh, finding ourselves in right now. And also, there, how many times have you found an old episode of a TV show, or an old episode of a podcast, or whatever? Like, how many times have you watched your friend's episode going, okay, her hair is totally different than mine and her clothes are totally different from mine, but that's exactly the day I had. Thank you that somebody uh-huh. gets this. It's like, so no one told you life was going to be this way, but they're showing you that it is. So, so yes, exactly. Yeah. I honestly, golly, this growing pain should underwrite this episode because <laughs> I'm like, I have another growing pains reference, but um, 
I recently did with a friend, um, we went back and kind of re did relive Growing Pains a little bit when it popped up on Amazon <laughs> Prime or something. And it was so funny because the last time I had watched it had been in the late 80s, early 90s when it was on, maybe some reruns after school, you know, that sort of thing. And yeah. um, I had identified with Mike and Carol and Ben, the kids, watching it again and having this realization that Jason Seaver, played by Alan Thick was two years younger than I was when the story started. Oh, weird. I felt so old, first of all. But then once I got over that, <laughs> I watched Growing Pains from this completely different lens of this This was never about the kids. This is about the parents. Interesting. Um, and it was so interesting. It really was. of like, this is about Jason and Maggie Seaver. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, sorry, I got so sidetracked there, but that was such yeah. an epiphany for me of like, because as a kid, I'm like, Kirk Cameron's cool. That's all I cared about. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, no, this was never for the kids. This was always for the parents. So, so yeah. yes. Anyway, that was, yeah. Yeah. But, and so now we see, we just circle back to stories are they are timeless in their own way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if anybody is struggling with, I don't know if I should put references to cell phones because, you know, maybe in a few years we'll only have, you know, implanted devices in our front frontal cortex. You know, I think it's okay. You don't have to necessarily have that, that uh, conversation with yourself because if the story is about real people and what they're really going through, then it's always going to work. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah. As it, it, at the heart of it will always transcend through the lens. And, and that's why, that's why the same stories get told through different lenses all the time. I mean, how many times have we told the story of Pride and Prejudice? Yeah. Um, you know, and ev I think every romance author is on an eternal quest to make their own version of some Austin hero, you know, <laughs> whether it's Darcy or... <sighs> Captain Wentworth, in my case, um, but <laughs> whatever it may be, it's like these these love stories. These are, in my case, or our cases, or or whatever it is. Um, the stories, like Solomon said, thousands of years ago, there is nothing new under the sun. Yeah. But the the heart of it gets to the heart of people that is always there, and yet by telling it through a different lens and through a different time and a different situation and setting it's like you're going to reach a group of people that weren't drawn into that other situation and setting and lens and time and so yeah like you said early on it's like right for your niche um or your niche and <laughs> uh, and let someone else write for theirs yeah yes exactly okay bethany ah I feel weird because every single episode, I'm like, I would love to talk to you more, but we really should shut it down. <laughs> and but I hope people understand by listening to these episodes that, like, seriously, these people I talk to are so fun and interesting. <laughs> so, but there are still some things that I want to talk about about this book. So we're okay. going to do lightning round. Got it. Okay. So like 30 I'll, I'll seconds to one minute. Yeah. For these. Okay. I can so, do it. Okay. In your press release, you said that although you watch a lot of cooking shows, you're not a very good cook. <laughs> so you had to do a lot of research for this book. True that. This, this is, the, first of all, high five. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I also am a terrible cook and I rely on my husband for sustenance. If he's not here, it's peanut butter and jam or microwavable something. Tuna yeah. fish. That's my go-to. Yeah. I'm your with thing. you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> So, just between us girls, yes, did you gain any weight while researching, quote unquote, and feel free to lie? <laughs> okay, then no, not at all. No. <laughs> no, honestly, I didn't. Because I didn't, anything that I wrote in the book, um, the recipes and the cooking methods, I just, re I have an informational knowledge now. I didn't actually try any of them. <laughs> Um, I probably should have. So if anyone tries anything, good luck to you. I have no idea what's actually going to be the outcome, but no, I didn't. Um, I, 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 not because of that reason. Anyway, did I gain weight? Probably. I always do what I'm writing. 
because I'm sitting in a chair snacking while I write. But I can't blame it on the chef book, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, now I feel weird about lying because I was going to say I did not gain any weight during the first few weeks of COVID-19. Stay at home. Um, it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm holding up the world's most delicious chocolate chip cookie that I just made last night. Oh, and suddenly I'm amazing. realizing if you... Um, if you make them according to the recipe and you start getting really, really good, because I, like, like your heroine Hadley, I'm an exceptionally good baker. <laughs> mm. So, yes, yesterday I made my mother-in-law's uh, cheddar beer bread recipe, and I made chocolate chip cookies from, you know, one of the one of the big internet sites, which they're all practically the same recipe. But oh. I don't know what happened. I did everything right, but I ended up with like 60 cookies. And I'm like, when I was a kid, I was sure these recipes made three dozen. <laughs> so now I've got to eat 60. Sorry. You have to. So I, I, I brought my, I brought my, what did I call oh. it? My, um, um, your prop. My your, prop. Yeah. Yes. My visual mm -hmm. aid. Yes. Um, <laughs> and you know what, just so everybody knows it was a, mm. Yeah. Oh, so soft. Like, oh, that was a soft yeah. one. Here's my, um, I gave up, pretty much gave up carbs in October. Wow. Um, not I can't completely. imagine. <laughs> uh, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Going low carb because pasta, <laughs> bread, those are the things I love. Potatoes. Me too. Uh, Maybe yeah. I'm an Enneagram three. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you are. That's the common thread. Is carbs. That's right. Um, yeah, but then it actually, this is not what we're talking about, and I'll keep it quick, but my, um, it actually ended up being such a blessing that I did that and had that little jump start because a couple months ago, my husband was diagnosed with diabetes, oh. and yeah, it's, he's got it under control, it's great, but it's like, so he had to go low carb, and so I was, my Enneagram self, my threeness, was so able to kick into gear, like, I know what to do. I got this. We got this. And, and so if only I cooked, that would help even more. But I was able to tell him what to buy so he could cook it at least. So that buy helps. tuna fish, right? Lots of tuna, carb free. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay. So, so but I'm enjoying watching the cookie though. So eat away. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, I'll live it's vicariously for really you. good. Um, the only thing is we have to remember that, um, that I said I lied when I didn't gain weight. So oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. I have to oh, well. do something. So this morning I got up and exercised. I'm like, I wonder how much, how many exercises I have to do for like, say an even 10 cookies today. <laughs> that's an even 10 hours is how much. <laughs> no! Okay. All right, you are a liar. Just kidding, I lied, I lied. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, like a half hour should do it. We'll, oh, we'll good, say that. good. I'm pretty yeah. sure it took me about 45 minutes to do my, my little oh, list. Then you're ahead of the curve. Have an extra cookie. Excellent, excellent, <laughs> will do. Okay, next question. So, of course, these are questions that, that relate to your book, which again, the name, the full name, the real name is? Hadley Beckett's Next Dish. Hadley Beckett's Next dish, which is very fun. I'm just telling people I started reading it and I'm killing me that I'm still talking to you guys and I can't go finish reading it. <laughs> okay. So next question from non-cooking person to non-cooking person who wrote a book okay. about people who are famous celebrity chefs. <laughs> Has anyone had a conversation like this when they were trying to help you edit this book? So my Pakistani friend laughed when I said, oh, I love nan bread. And he's like, you realize nan is bread or non. Um, he's like, that's like me saying, I love bread bread. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I was just wondering if you had any of those kinds of edits. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Um, they said that's like saying chai tea is like saying tea tea. I'm like, tea tea. Oh, I did not oh, know this. I never would have thought of that. Yeah. Yikes. Um, Apparently sorry. Starbucks doesn't care. I, they don't. Tea they also have mocha coffee. Isn't it a mocha? Like, <laughs> That's what I was always wondering. <laughs> of course, being the former banker, I always got so annoyed with PIN number. Is it your personal right. identification number number? Yes. An ISBN number. Yes. Yeah. yes. Or ATM machine, automated teller machine machine. So <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> So uh, the only one that and I are going to be mind, friends for life. We are. We are. We're it's set in set in stone. Um, <laughs> the only thing that comes to mind, and this was relatively minor because I did do my research pretty well, but um, my line editor um, just had to ask the question, 
why is he preheating the oven to make his risotto? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I had this moment of, I, mean, I don't know, should he not? Like, I literally had to go and research. I'm like, oh, risotto's on a stove top. Okay, got it. So that was really the only one where I felt pretty dumb. Um, <laughs> it's like, because the whole point of risotto is stirring it on the stove top. And yeah, ah. so. Okay, but I other didn't than know that, that either. <laughs> see, thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm like, I, didn't, I just didn't even research that one too well, but. Yeah, thankfully my line editor knew better. So yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that stuff comes out of the kitchen. So and out of restaurant kitchens. I I not really been in many restaurant kitchens. How would yeah. I know that the risotto How is made on know? the stove? Exactly. <laughs> I just know it's delicious. What more do right? I need to know? Yeah. But apparently Max Cavanaugh, the greatest chef of all time, would would know this. Whatever. So Yeah, okay. Know uh, it all. I know. <laughs> so annoying. <laughs> Bethany, this is totally awesome. Now I just need to ha ask you so that everybody can know where can people find you and your books because I think they're going to want to check them out. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you said, my, my website, cbethanywright.com, that will direct you all the other places that you can find me. But I would really say um, I, I love connecting with people on Facebook and Instagram, um, especially on Facebook. We have a, I love doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one chats and we do, I actually have a thing called the book club closest to my house. Um, that <laughs> is a reference from the secret life of Sarah Hollenbeck, but it's my reader group. And there's about 200 of us in there right now. And we oh. get together for live Facebook live chats once a month and all of this. And um, so find me on Instagram, Facebook, and I'm at C. Bethany Wright on all the things. So you can find me there. Um, but yeah, I would, I would definitely love to connect on social media because that's where I, I do. That's where my true personality comes out the most, of, <laughs> which basically your listeners and viewers have seen here today. So it's like, <laughs> if this didn't annoy you, connect with me on social because you'll find more of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. And Hadley Beckett's next dish at the time that this comes out on May 7th has just re been released in stores. You can find it just everywhere, released. right? Yeah. And of course, Oprah was raving about it yesterday. Uh, can we just, bet. can we like yes. speak things into being that have happened? Write the story in the future. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, Chris Pratt just reached out about the film rights yesterday. You know, because um, he probably would do a great job. He would do a great job. He would be a phenomenal Max. Um, yeah. So he, and so he's interested in the rights. I think Good. it's going to be Reese Witherspoon's book club pick next month. So people right. have that to look forward to. Yeah. Um, Cause it's already, you know, it's not the first of May anymore. So it's, yeah. it's not. So June I think, pick. I think June is the, is the goal for that. But, um, that would all be <laughs> lovely, but in reality, um, <laughs> Hey, we don't know what the future holds. We so we can't it's, say in reality yet. <laughs> that's true. Chris Pratt, if you're watching, if that's this right. hasn't happened, call me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, it's yeah, it'll be available wherever books are sold um, on um, in print and ebook and audio. Great. Um, so yeah, so be sure to check it out. And uh, yeah, I just hope people will enjoy it. And it's very much a story of um, redemption and forgiveness, but it's also. I got to write some of my favorite kissing scenes I've ever gotten to write. So when you combine ah. those two themes, how can you not want to read this book? You know? All right. Now I really, I'm sorry. We have to hang up because I need to go find out and I want to read the really good kissing scenes. <laughs> okay. Bethany, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh. You've been a joy. Thank you. I have enjoyed this so, so much.